it, it, it facilitates the idea of being expressed, you know, the part of the brain that thinks of stuff and the ability to, uh, to get it out. So listen, it, it's hard to We want, anybody object if I like my cigar? Nope. No. no. I like mine too. No, I don't want to do it because it would be all right in here and it would be fantastic because then when we open the door, it's just like it. Happens, you know? If I was a real man, if I was a man, I wouldn't be afraid of what, what are they going to do to me? I mean, I've already been castrated on television. So. <laughs> Command, yeah, commander gave you a proof. Oh, the castration of Starbuck. <laughs> One of the saddest things in the annals of American television. It was only the beginning, though, you know. It was only the beginning of, 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 of the feminization of, of television, getting rid of, you know, anything masculine. Because, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're booked. We're full. <laughs> I just, I started a little early. Usually I have a half hour. It usually takes me a half hour just to figure, just to get focused. You can ask my old girlfriends. Actually, actually, it took me one and a half hour. It took me several weeks to get up the nerve to ask somebody to have dinner. Uh, so um, yeah, I came in from Montana. I was real cranky when I got here. Because the flight from Montana, there was a screaming kid right behind me. And I was a single dad, you know. The only thing I'm really proud of, two things, Kamikaze Cowboy Book and Raising My Children. I have three children, two of which are raised by myself, George and Roland. And when, I, when they were uh, four and six, she left us and went back to show business. And we, I had to move the family to Montana, so. So there I was. So it's it's been a twenty year journey, not really, to eighteen years. And I did all the cooking and the washing and the cleaning up and the dropping off and the picking up and the socket and the concerts and this. So all my friends were single moms, so it's like I, I have this whole <laughs> life. I mean it's a huge chunk out of my life that uh, I don't really ever talk about or share, but uh, I'm well known up there where I live for that, for doing that because they knew I was famous. So it was a little disconcerting because here was this TV guy, you know, picking his kids up and dropping them off, and then you know soccer trips. I was always in the in the motels in Billings and in Spokane and Missoula and Helena and all these different places. I was in the laundry room in the motels with all the wives and the you know, washing the team's clothes and organizing everything. It was a little, it was a little weird, but I've done the guy thing for so long, it was actually quite, quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of, uh, uh, I was talking about screaming kids. And the second <laughs> that was his cue. Uh, no, anyway, so I know a lot about, I know, I do, lot about raising children and I was very involved, as involved as you could be, 24-7. I raised my kids without television. You know, they didn't have TV till they were 10 and 12. Because we moved, we went, we went, we were in Montana in a little log cabin. Well, it was 900 square feet, beautiful log cabin. It was my bachelor pad, you know, I had it all tricked out. It had a, and I built a little lean-to on the back and the boys had bunk beds a wood cook stove, wood heat. Um, so they lived this, it's funny, they lived this, 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 this throwback life. Because I grew up in Montana, I grew up and I worked on ranches with kerosene lamps and wood and all this stuff was, and I loved it. So when I would bring, you know, uh, uh, Charlie's Angels up to Montana for a, for a week, uh, Kate Jackson was a girlfriend for, for a long time, off and on. I met her in New York in 1970 and then she became a big TV star and, and changed, and we went off and on for a while. But she, they would bring gals up, and, and they would freak out. They would we'd come into this, this cabin that had kerosene lamps and wood cook stove, and, and it was very romantic, and they loved it. They wouldn't want to live there forever, but... But so I was raising my children that way, and, um, and did until 2002. I built a house, and so I have a beautiful house there's a big kind of, you know, right on the lake with all this glass and look out over the thing, and so it's good. But when my sons come back to visit with their friends, 
What do they run to? Not the big house with the fire pool and the fancy rec room and the pool table. No. And what do they talk about? And, and I listen to them talking, you know, where they're sitting out on the deck with the beer. They talk about the cabin. They talk about what it was like in that cabin and getting up in the morning and coming out. Dad's got the wood cook stove going and Beethoven playing and they, or Sinatra or whoever. I love music. My whole thing is music. So they grew up with that. And they're little. They don't know any better. Uh, in the song. That was a really, really, really special, the, the most special time of my life was those uh, 15 years, which, you know, should have been the worst because I had no job, I had no wife, I had two kids, it's like, and I ended up being a counselor for all the single parents because they were so, you know, depressed by not having I tried to tell them, you know, it's it's the best, it's very brief, and it's also the best time of your life with the children. So I want, I would like to write another book about that, but it it's not politically doable. I could do it in private because a guy, I never got. It's funny, you know, like single moms get a lot of attention, but a single dad, and I've met other men who have done what I've done. We get no, not only. They don't believe you. Like even in Montana when I'm doing it, and they go, they all kind of, yeah, well, yeah, but, but, but. So I would be standing with three or four single moms and some would go, oh, God, how tough it must be, how tough to the, to the moms. And I'm standing there. And then they go, they said, there, how's it going? Yeah, here you go. Nobody ever said to me, ever, except my sister, you know, I, oh, it must be tough. Are you all right? How are you handling it? How are you managing I had no life. I had no, I had no life. My life was like, I had a life, but I mean, I didn't. These girls were saying, I'd say, yeah, you have a life. There they are, those two boys there. Those are your life. That's your life. Well, yeah, but I need my, I need my. I said, well, they, I'm, well, you should have thought of that, but now you don't. <laughs> now you got a kid, but they don't. They have the boyfriends. I don't want to go off on this, but I, I could. They have the boyfriends and the one, and then they fall in love, and then the guy spends two months, and then he's gone. Then they can, then there's another guy. And then, it was just awful, and I would see their kids get angry and confused. And so not all, no, no. Some of them listen to me. I said, you cannot do that. So, but so I got no, I, I, I didn't get any, uh, and I still, still don't, but I don't need it. I get it from my sons, uh, understand completely how special it was what I did for them, especially given I, I could have stayed in Hollywood or gone back with them to try and, you know, to not try, but to continue my career, to continue doing it and chasing it and maybe get another TV series and all that. And I was still good looking, you know, that was 1994, for Christ's sake. That was 20 some years ago. <laughs> I still was. But, um, so I had this incredible experience. And in the midst of that, I'll tell you this one, I don't have time to, oh, I, I still got, that's, yeah. um, no, I can have a relationship. I got 28 minutes. To <laughs> I got lots of time. Um, in college, like all of you, I had a sweetheart. Do you know this story? I've told it a couple times. I might have you shut. Are you that recording? No. You're not taking it. No. Uh, so, I call her sweetheart. Her name is Bambi. Bambi Joy. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. She was as beautiful as her name. She was good. And she was in the theater. And I met her. I met her. Uh, I was a football player. And I, you know, I got drunk in my freshman year and auditioned for a musical and then sobered up and found out they cast me in the role and I tried to get out of it and they wouldn't let me out of it. I had no interest. That's how I got into this whole thing. About it. So it's true. I just was with my the, my football buddy friend from college 50 years ago. We, we were just together and he was he was laughing about it because he was with me on that Saturday afternoon when the college were walking by and said spring auditions. I remembered how that I said, and I do, we're walking by, he says, yeah, you said, I could do that. And I said, you know, I could do that, and there's auditions. So they go, oh, yeah, 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 oh, sure you could, you, know, you want to go in there, weirdos. And 
I said, oh, you did. So they put up some money. We couldn't remember how much it was. And I went in and auditioned. And I remember every aspect of that. I can tell it to you now, but it would take too long. Going in the dark theater with the lights and the people and the sound and the smell, the thing and what I did. Then I came out and they were all hooting and hollering and laughing and I was, I forgot about it until I ran into this guy in the dorm who said, oh dude, from the theater. I've never talked to this guy, Brian O'Reilly. He was a theater geek and you know, I am. He goes, oh, Dirk, 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 congratulations, you got the lead. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is at the time. I didn't know what a lead was. <laughs> lead, I, I, I do. I had the lead, I didn't know. He said, and then he said, K. Lord Ravenel, you had, you had. Oh, God, it was awful. I spent three, I spent a whole week. I was not, I was, I was, I was sick to my stomach. I was so upset by it. I didn't want to do this so bad. I had to go to the rehearsals. And then I fell in love with the theater, and and, and I fell in love with the the process. I love I love uh, the whole. I still it's my favorite part of acting is is theater on stage, which is where I started and where I recently did Lieutenant Colombo. I toured United Kingdom, Scotland, Ireland, and, and England and Wales, uh, playing Lieutenant Colombo, the TV guy, on stage. It was originally a Broadway play, which I didn't know. A wonderful play and somebody got the rights to it. It was on Broadway in 1961. And I did that on stage, so it was great. I got to go back to my roots and, and do theater. I just did that, uh, five, uh, 2011, I think it was. And, uh, and the best part of it was, <laughs> there's a whole other deal, you know. I was the last guy to smoke on English television. I did Celebrity Big Brother. And, and, and they said, no, no cigars? And, and, the, and I said, no cigar, no, no cigar, no Benedict. And uh, so <laughs> then they, they came to this big TV channel and they, they said, okay. So I said, one box a week, that's 20 cigars. So they bought them, they bought Monte, they said, what car, oh. And my agent calls, I'm still in Montana. And I told my, my one son had graduated, my, my youngest was a junior. And I said, and he's dad, dad, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> To, and I spent saying no. I, I should tell you how much money they offered me, but I don't want to. I mean, they offered me one hundred fifty thousand dollars to go for a month, and I said no. Then they offered me two hundred and fifty. I said no. I'm not going to go. I can't be away from my son. It was basketball season. He was in. Then they offered me three hundred and fifty thousand. <laughs> oh my God! And it's only thirty days. Now it is. Battle, it is. You got to be locked up with a bunch of weird people. Man. But I'm, 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 <laughs> I could do I could do a two hour talk about what went on in Celebrity Big Brother. <laughs> but they offered me finally more than that and I said yes. And then I went and did it and and almost won it, but uh, when my sons find out I've been saying no all this time, they were very upset. But it's much more important for me to be with them for them to be with me. You know, the more time you spend with children when they're little, the more secure they are, and the quicker they leave the nest, and the more independent confident they are. So, you know, they don't work, they, they know you so well because you've been with them so much. So by the time they're 14, 15, 16, 17, they, they're gone, they, they, you're, they become friends, they want to fly. So I took the theater and I met Bambi Joy and she was beautiful and, and but she hated me because she was what was called a feminist. This is 1965. I don't know. I, when I first heard it, I thought it was a religion, you know, like Methodist. <laughs> I swear to God. I said, this is a Methodist. I said, well, I'm a Methodist. I'm a Methodist. I said, no, 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 that's women. And he explained it to me. I thought, what a crock. That's, that's crazy. That, that makes no sense. It goes against Mother Nature. I mean, all this stuff. Anyway, and, and she, was, she, was, she was the leading woman on campus. And drop dead beautiful, just so beautiful. And every guy on, on I wanted a date with her, and she was, I wouldn't have anything to do with anybody. So, fade on fade. So, the end of my sophomore year, there's at the end of the year, and I've done this play called The Knack. They made a movie out of it with Michael Crawford. This is all before any of you were born. <laughs> but Mike, so, they, so I, I had done it, and, and it was a big success. So now I'm sort of accepted to the theater. Before that, my freshman, after I did the musical, then I did another play, my sophomore, then this book. But the first two, I was still in, I was 
you know, I was not one of them. I was kind of slumming, you know, I was the football guy that was there. And the football guys thought I was really weird or something wrong with me that I'm doing this theater stuff. The theater guys thought, you know, he's not a real actor, he's a football guy. He's not very good, you know, look at him. He doesn't, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not one of us, he's just, but I did this play called The Knack and I won the Best Actor Award because it was going on now. And it's a huge so I, so now I'm at this party, the end of the year, it's like the week we all leave, at the professor's house. This was, this was very uh, exotic, you know, exciting times, and there was booze, everybody's drinking. And it was fun, it was a whole theater crowd, and I was part of it then, they, I was included. And she was there, Bambi was there, and this is how I met her, because I never had anything to do with her. All my buddies, these good-looking football guys, they tried to get dates with Bambi Joy. She pissed over all every one of them. She wouldn't. She didn't have anyone. She dated one guy. This really nerdy, uh, smoked cigarettes, and he was kind of a con man. It was weird. It was weird. But so everybody. So she was there. So we got into a conversation, and I, I won't. I gotta. I can't go on. But so we got into this conversation about, of course, because she's a feminist, and I'm a. I'm a. I'm a. Um, cowboy from Montana, <laughs> and it's like oil and vinegar. It's like fire and water. It's, it's just, it's just the sparks are flying instantly. And we're in this. And she's really smart, and and so we're just into this huge argument. And I, as I remember, was winning all the points, but, <laughs> but she was sitting on the edge of the couch like this, and I'm standing like this. And then something comes up, and I turn, I'm talking, you know, and everybody's a little drunk and tipsy, and we're all 20 years old, and, you know, 20, 21. And all of a sudden, I feel, some, I feel something, and I look down, and she has my arm out like that, and she's buried her teeth into my forearm. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> I still have the scar. 60 years, 50 years later, she was biting my arm. Wow. And she's so angry. And she's like, I look down, and she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her, and she just bites. <laughs> and then I see blood. A blood goes out of that. Blood goes down, out, down my arm. And I'm thinking, this hurts, but goddamn, she's so beautiful. <laughs> it's true. All I can think of is I, I wanted to kiss her. I just wanted to, it was like, it hurt, but it just, and then she stopped, and that was it. And so I went back, and that was, we never spoke again. I mean, she walked away, but there was that moment, this intense, psychological, psychosexual, psychosexual. It was full of everything, it was just, it was crazy. So then I went home to Montana, and uh, of course, I couldn't get her. So I found out where she was, she was doing theater in Utah. So I wrote a letter to the theater there in, uh, in uh, Cedar City, it's called Shakespeare, Utah Shakespeare Festival. And being a good theater gal, she was doing things. So I wrote her a letter. So we wrote letters all summer. And I fell in love with her letters and she fell in love with mine. Went back to college, we met each other and it was a bit like, okay, letters are one thing, but this is, so the whole thing began. It was, it was, it was the most intense love affair of my life. It almost killed me, but, and her. But so, this girl, I, when we graduated, I went to acting school. We were going to get married. We we're going to get married before I did my last year in, in, in acting school. Two weeks before the wedding, I'm doing summer stock in Flint, Michigan, and I get a I get a phone call at my little place. I'm sharing with four guys who do this, and it's her. It's Bambi. It's two weeks before I go to California. She's from Santa Monica to get married, and she says, "I'm not going to marry." You. We've been together four years, been engaged for two years. This wedding has been planned. It's a big wedding because her parents had some money and so, and she's got a teaching job back where I'm going to acting school. She's gone to all the trouble. She's applied, she's been accepted. We've got an apartment rented. We're gonna finish the last year and then go on with our married lives. And she's telling me, I'm not gonna marry you. That was in 1968. In 1998, my phone rang, and I said to her, I said, she says, I'm not going to marry you. And, and I almost, I almost 
if I was older, I had a heart attack. I said, but, uh, I, I, I said, but well, why? She said, I'll tell you when we're old and gray. <laughs> that was it. So I was messed up for a long time. Until a Swedish girl five years later did the exact <laughs> same thing, and that messed me up. And then, and then five years after that, I was in love with this this girl, and she did the exact same thing with the phone call. Said, "No, goodbye, I'm never going to." I know I got that. And then my wife, when she left, she did the same thing. She said, "Can you pick the kids up from school?" I said, "Yes, because I'm leaving." Okay. And I thought she meant to do. Oh, she was gone. Never, I didn't see her. Gone. God cleared the house out, took the clothes out the car, gone. So I've had four times I've had women just go, I'm leaving, goodbye. And these are women that were like, you know, quote unquote, madly passionate in love with me. The last one I had two children with. First one I was two weeks away from a wedding that, I mean, you know, we both wanted that. I wanted to marry her. She wanted it. Really, there was never any. So my phone rings and I pick it up. I say, hi. And and she says, I hear this voice say, Dirk. And I said, I'm not old and I'm not gray, but I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, wasn't it? I know. <laughs> Part of my brain was going, wow, that was quick. That was <laughs> you know, you may be a success someday. <laughs> no, I was 98. I thought, geez, if I ever write a book about this, you know, that's going to be the title. I said, no, I can't write the book either. You know, it's, you know has anybody read uh, And Then We Went Fishing? Well, then, yeah, of course you have. So you know, so you know this story because she's in there. But I say at the end, well, I'm not. I'm still waiting. I want to know because when I wrote the book in 1990, whenever I wrote it, 93, I didn't know the answer to why this woman abandoned me. Um, and it was a big, you know, it's one of those things in your life. So. Uh, I gotta make this, I gotta show this up. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I'll come back to Kansas City, or St. Joe's next week, and we'll finish the rest of the story. <laughs> 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 if you all go buy me a rice ball, I'll tell the rest of the story. Uh, no, the rest of the story. So I gotta show it, but uh, is, this, is this holding your interest? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> not no, I'm like, I could hold Bambi's interest. I didn't hold hers. I didn't hold my wife's. I didn't hold. It's really weird. I think I figured it out why these women who love me so much and pursued me so hard and, and did so many wonderful things, why they would just, oh, I'm gone. What's that? I mean, that's weird. Four times. The Swedish, the Bambi, the Swedish girl. Joanne was married to the guy who produced Happy Days, you know, and, and Laverne and Shirley, and she married a really rich guy, and she was, and we did a movie that felt like a crazy love, and she left her husband, and we did, and then and we were getting married, and then the same thing happened. And I told my wife, the girl I eventually married, I told her all these stories. She goes, those, those women are really nice, that's me. And the way they did, she, my wife would tell me, well, they did that so you would never forget them. They knew that, and then and you have it. You keep talking about Bambi. You remember they did that on purpose, that's so that you'll never forget. I said, well, that's that's you. Don't know. And then of course my wife does the same damn thing. So <laughs> I don't know. And then they wonder why I drink. <laughs> <laughs> now some people that know me don't wonder why I drink. Uh, actually, I don't drink. I didn't drink, start drinking until I was fifty. When my wife left. I turned 50. She left February 8th, 1990, 1995. And I turned 50 on March 1st, 1995. It's my mom's birthday. And a good friend of mine in, uh, in California sent me a case of 18-year-old McAllen's single malt scotch. Mm. If you know scotch, you're an 18-year-old. Today it sells for like 300 bucks a bottle. And he sent me a case of it. And I started drinking, you know, because I was with the kids alone in this cabin. And they would go to bed, and I'd have a couple shots of scotch. And, uh, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't drink when I was leaving Battlestar. I mean, I had Guinness every now and then. Battlestar Drive, the 18. Who had time? We worked 17 hours a day, and then on the break, I was. And then I never, never drank much. I do now, I drink scotch, but. 
I talk about it more than, than I do it, like everything. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I'm not old and I'm not gray, but I'm listening. And she tells me that she got pregnant by me when we saw each other in Montana before I went off to school. And then we were to get married in August and she was pregnant and she got the job and it was all right, but I never saw her again. Because back in those days, we didn't fly around like you all do now. It was very expensive flying was, and we didn't have any money. So we didn't see each other for all that time. Uh, actually, I did see her Thanksgiving. She flew out to Michigan where I was going to school. We spent Thanksgiving together, she back. And she was what? Then she was like four, three months pregnant or something. Because I teased her. She said, don't you remember you teased me about putting on weight? I said, yeah, I remember that. But I thought it was because you were in love with me. You were sad. You were eating to compensate for missing that. I didn't. She said, well, she was three or four months pregnant. Anyway, April, she had the baby. Gave it up for it. Gave it away. And then, I was April 23rd. And then she's thinking, well, as it got closer to the wedding, well, I can't marry the love guy. I, I, I'm assuming. She's never really. She won't talk about it. But I'm assuming. The reason is that marry this guy, keep the secret for the next whatever years. I don't know. Anyway, she just ran away. She just ran off into the, her life and never told me. So uh, the reason she called me was the child she gave away had gotten in touch with her. And his story is more interesting than my side of the story. It's fantastic, but I just talked to him this morning. We're getting together. My mother's going to be 100 years old, August 2nd. Wow. So, and she was just Grand Marshal in the 4th of July parade. She's a beautiful woman, and, and she could pass. I said, Mom, you know, you could pass for 80, 85 max. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds terrible, except yeah, if you're 100, good. it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. She said, oh, you think so? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find you a guy. <laughs> no, she did last thing she wants. 100 yeah. Anyway, uh, so he's becoming this 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 guy. My our Pammy's and my offspring, John, is coming, and he's a great guy. And he's more like me than my other two sons. He's a clone. He's a he's a, he's a clone except he's six two, and he talk, he does this all the time when he talks. He goes, oh, he, he, he. he looks just like me except his hair is darker, like his biological mother. But anyway, I don't know. He says, well. She says, I gave him away, and, and, and the boy, little boy, and he got in touch with me. I'm calling because he uh, would it be all right. He wants to know if it's all right if he wrote you a letter. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, of course it's all right. Of course. So, so John wrote me this wonderful letter, and uh, he came, then came by in Montana on his way to Alaska with a buddy to see me. He's just going to come by my cabin, the little log cabin, 1998, and my kids were visiting their mom in California and taking them down. And so he showed up with his buddy, this old Volkswagen bus, came in for a cup of coffee and stayed for six weeks. He came in for a cup of coffee. His friend, Latin, his friend went to sleep. His friend, the like, we talked for like 12 hours. We just never stopped talking. It was like, it was like crazy. So he tells me this story. So he, he was always messed up because he was he's like me. He's a wanderer. He's a vagabond. He's a dreamer. He's he likes to do different things. He he's not crazy about. He doesn't need to be rich or famous, but he he just needs adventure and new experiences and people and everything. And he loves old trucks and he loves the mountains. And his dad's an investment banker in Minneapolis. And his dad tells him, you're no good, you're a failure, you're not gonna amount to anything because you can't even mind that. So he's all messed up. So he runs away at home from home when he's 18. And one thing leads to another. So finally, he's 28 or 29, 